remember we were all very excited and the customs doors were opening and closing and I remember jumping up as the customs doors opened and closed to try to catch a glimpse of Srila Prabhupada. And I recall uh, my first glance, my first glimpse of Prabhupada was uh, he was standing uh, very patiently. He had a, his attaché case in one hand, he had his cane in another and he had his chada folded and over his shoulder. And he, he appeared to be very, very effulgent and um, very peaceful. And he appeared to be waiting for something. Uh, in fact, he was waiting for Vagavan, who had been held up at immigration. In fact, immigra uh, immigration authorities told him that he could not enter the country because he did not have a visa. Uh, they had warned him in Singapore that he would not be able to come into Australia without a valid visa, but somehow they'd let, they'd let him uh, join the plane in Singapore. Now, Prabhupada was waiting for Vagavan, and it appeared that Vagavan, who is his Prabhupada's secretary for the trip, or rather servant, it appeared that Bali Madan would not be able to be allowed into the country, so, sorry, uh, Vagavan. So Vagavan, um, he uh, explained to the immigration man that uh, even though uh, he did not have a visa, he was married to an Australian, because in fact Prabhupada had married him to Padmavati in the Cross Maidan Pandal program in Bombay in front of 30,000 people a few days or a few weeks before. He remembered this and he told the immigration man that even though he didn't have a visa, he was married to an Australian. So the immigration man asked him for his marriage certificate. He told him that he didn't have one, but he did have a photograph of his wedding. <laughs> so he showed the man the photograph of his wedding and in the photograph was a picture of Prabhupada uh, performing the, the wedding ceremony. And the immigration man had noticed when Prabhupada came through and he was, he was, he was somehow other moved by seeing Prabhupada. Uh, this was the main man in the office, the, the man at the desk at sent Vagavan to speak to the head man. So the head man sent Vagavan back with a, a stamp in his passport, uh, indefinite stay. <laughs> so he showed his passport to the man at the desk who was incredulous, but nevertheless, Vagavan could understand this was Prabhupada's uh, potency, and Vagavan then was able to come through. So we were waiting for some time. Prabhupada entered the airport terminal. There was a huge kirtan, and it, it appeared that the whole, t the whole airport stopped and Prabhupada attracted a very, very large crowd. There were photographs taken and it was quite amazing how many people were actually crowded around at the time. Everything appeared to come to a standstill. Of course, Churu had told all the ladies, when Prabhupada comes through, don't scream. Uh, and of course, when the Prabhupada came through, all the ladies screamed. <laughs> and uh, everybody paid their obeisances. They paid dandabats, full dandabats. In those days, you might have seen from our videos, the ladies used to pay their dandabats too. So everyone just paid dandabats wherever they were and uh, Prabhupada couldn't move because we were just crisscrossing the path. And the, a lot of devotees, just, they just stayed down there and they didn't move. They didn't know, they wasn't, weren't sure how long they were supposed to stay down there and they just stayed. <laughs> so some devotees had to tap them on the shoulder and say... So then we stood up and there was a nice kirtan and we were following Prabhupada through the airport terminus. Now, I don't recall the press conference but there definitely was one. Uh, we were all fairly del delirious. Churu recalls that when he paid his obeisances at Prabhupada's arrival, he banged his head on the, on the floor so heavily that he had a mild concussion. <laughs> and uh, everything was very, very hazy. But we were all delirious in some way or other, spiritually or materially, and we... Uh, I don't remember the press conference, but in the newspaper there was a very nice description of the press conference where Prabhupada described how there were, there were four orders of life, Brahmachari, uh, Grihastha, Vanaprastha and Sannyas. The, the press reporter was very, had written a very pukka article and had quoted all these Sanskrit names, spelling them properly, which was quite amazing. And uh, Prabhupada described that he was in this, the fourth order of life, which meant now he was, his business was to travel and preach. And uh, Prabhupada's uh, arrival was noted in the Sydney Morning Herald, The Australian, and one Sydney Daily newspaper. Although at the time we were not familiar with accessing the newspapers, I don't know how many of us knew that those things were in the paper at the time, but looking through the archives we found this information with some nice pictures of Prabhupada. One question was uh, by a reporter who asked uh, 
he asked Prabhupada, uh, <coughs> yours is a very ascetic movement, isn't it? And uh, uh, Prabhupada says, uh, no. And then he said, that isn't uh, your, yours more a self-denial type of lifestyle? And uh, Prabhupada said, no, no, we teach love, love of, love of God. And uh, then the reporter said, uh, but don't you think that, you know, we, 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 we've seen and we've heard that uh, you're going to be taken away from here in a Rolls Royce. We'd previously uh, uh, hired a Rolls Royce with a chauffeur and everything like that. To, uh, it wasn't a, a new Rolls Royce, <laughs> kind of an old Rolls Royce, but, you know, it had the Rolls Royce label and everything, so it was quite significant to the press. And so Prabhupada said, well, uh, we can use everything in uh, Krishna's service. If uh, someone uh, offers me a Rolls Royce, uh, why should I refuse it? <laughs> he said that uh, <clears throat> a guru is uh, God's representative. Everything is meant to be used in uh, God's service. So he said, uh, Krishna, he rides in a gold chariot. And he said, what is this Rolls Royce? Some tin, some rubber, some wood? He said, I, I, uh, I say it is not enough. <laughs> Uh, that with all the devotees go, Jai Prabhupada. <laughs> so I, I was think, actually, I was thinking beforehand, this is, uh, you know, should we be doing this? Whose idea was this <laughs> with this Rolls Royce? I was a little bit worried of what would people think about this, you know? It's a little ostentatious, some vainglorious or something like that. Well, you know, but then, you know, Prabhupada's answer was so bold that even the press, who are used to sort of being sharp and with a quick response and a quick reply to, practically anyone, but uh, there was just a silence. I mean, they were so shocked by Prabhupada's response <laughs> that they, uh, they, they just were flabbergasted. They just couldn't say any more. <laughs> the Prabhupada, Jai Prabhupada, we paid our obeisances, some silence, and Prabhupada said, Jai, chant Hare Krishna, and then Prabhupada got up and we had Kirtan to the car. He, he went into the Rolls Royce and uh, drove away. And <clears throat> the, first time, the very first time I saw Prabhupada was when I went down to the Domain in Sydney. For every Sunday, the, the devotees would go and speak there. <coughs> and um, on this particular weekend, uh, the devotees said I had to come back to the temple because Prabhupada was speaking there. The spiritual master had come from America and from India. And um, so I went to the temple to see Srila Prabhupada. But he didn't give the lecture. He had Hanuman Swami give the lecture, which impressed me because I thought, well, he, he, he has, he, I'd already read it, Easy Journey to Other Planets. Um, which I got off from a devotee on the street, and um, I was very impressed by that book, in as much as I realised that it wasn't about going to other planets at all. So I thought this this, this guru is, is a, knows how to attract um, different people, and for a higher purpose. So I already had this idea, and so when it, when I went to the temple when Prabhupada wasn't speaking. Um, some, for some, somehow or other it had the effect of making me think that the knowledge was absolute and he wasn't promoting himself as a personality cult and that really impressed me. And um, after the lecture, I, I somehow drifted towards the, uh, the temple and went in one side of the kitchen and Srila Prabhupada got up from the Vyasasan and he arrived at the opposite kitchen door at the same time as I arrived, came through the other door and so Prabhupada stopped and looked at me, and I, I went like this. I, I thought he was, and I realised he was actually looking at me, not my body, just at me. And um, I thought he was looking at someone else, and so I sort of stared, stared back at him, and he gave me this look, like a disgusted look, like you know, where have you been, sort of thing, you know. And um, uh, that Prabhupada's eyes, riveting me, um, had a very profound effect on me. My husband Ajit, he had, he had. Um he was from Sweden and he had written to Srila Prabhupada and asked if he could go and do some service there in his own country. So when Srila Prabhupada actually came to, to, to Sydney at Glebe, um, he called us in and said that um, he wanted us to go to Sweden and um, he, he's, he, uh, he asked about Sweden, what was it like there, and Ajit was telling Srila Prabhupada, and, he, and Ajit asked, Srila Prabhupada, should we go out on Harinam? Or, you know, he wa Ajit wanted to preach in the universities, and he said, you know, maybe they're not going to look upon us going out in dhotis and everything. 
very well in Sweden, so what should we do, Srila Prabhupada? And Srila Prabhupada said, that's all right, you can wear suit. You don't have to do that. You wear suit and tie, and, and, um, and your wife can wear a long dress, and you can go and, and, uh, and preach like that. <coughs> um, we also asked Srila Prabhupada if we could, if we could have deities, and Srila Prabhupada, because we were going to go to the first, I think it was Mayapur festival on the way to Sweden. We were going to go to India first, and then, uh, well, we had planned to go overland to save money, but Srila Prabhupada told us. He said no. He said, "I realize you're a very adventurous young young couple, but um, no, this is not very advisable. It's very dangerous. So you can uh, save up a bit more money and and fly." So um, we we thought then we could go through India and we asked Srila Prabhupada if we could buy deities and we asked what kind of deities and Srila Prabhupada said yes you can get Radha Krishna or Gornitai and uh, we said well it, when we go to Sweden um, what would be best he said either Radha Krishna or Gornitai but not to install immediately so um, we did we bought uh, Gornitai deities when we were there um, <laughs> then Srila Prabhupada, um, for, for about 10 minutes, he just sat there and he just looked at both of us. Very, very, um, just very, very deep. He was thinking. And then he opened his eyes very wide and he looked at me and he said, who do you love more, Krishna or your husband? <laughs> um, and I didn't know what to say because I realized I didn't love Krishna and I also didn't love my husband. <laughs> um, so, uh, I just kind of burst into tears. <laughs> And Srila Prabhupada then had a very, very big grin on his face. <laughs> so I, couldn't, I just couldn't understand Prabhupada's mind, what he was thinking. Anyway, then Srila Prabhupada said, he said, if you go, and, you go to Sweden and, and um, preach on behalf of... Uh, <laughs> if you go to Sweden on behalf, on behalf of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he will give you all of his blessings. So, we got the blessings of Srila Prabhupada um, to go to Sweden. I remember this incident in, in Melbourne in 1974. We always wanted to bring some gift to Prabhupada because it was such a nice thing to give something or a flower or whatever, uh, you know, uh, devotees, when we were in Perth, Hans Duda Maharaj sent shoes, new shoes for Prabhupada, all the way from Germany or something, and the reciprocation was Prabhupada sent him back his old shoes. I told the devotee, uh, Shruti said. So, devotees were always trying to think of something, you know, give Prabhupada something. So I was uh, in the temple room, in St. Kilda one morning, and it's very crowded, and Prabhupada was arriving in his Vyasasan down that end. I was way up at this end. He couldn't see anything, but I heard Prabhupada say, don't touch the Bhagavatam to the floor. So I always pictured in my mind that his servant had maybe bowed down with his Bhagavatam in the hand and touched it to the floor. I was telling him, don't do that. So I uh, thought, well, I had this idea to get a book cover made, and I asked one of the ladies who sewed for the deities to make this this cover that had jari cloth and tassels and a pink lining from Didi cloth remnants. And uh, I thought that'd be a nice gift for Prabhupada. And uh, I uh, also bought some mangoes in town, some really nice peachy pink mangoes, which were out of season and hard to find. And I brought uh, with those in a, in a 
BTG box. We used to have these <laughs> BTG boxes after the magazines were distributed. Uh, when Mataji had knitted a scarf for Prabhupada, a wool scarf, brown tassels. And so when Prabhupada was in his room, he was speaking to pretty much a full room of devotees, serious subject matter. And um, I came in and I had this box, you know, I sat down, I offered my obeisances and I was just sitting and listening. And so there was a pause in the conversation and Prabhupada looked at the box, he said, so? What is this? So the thing is, my mood was, I thought, oh, I touched the microphone. The thing is, my mood was, I thought I had some good things for Prabhupada. I found some good gifts to give to Prabhupada. So, so maybe you could say puffed up. I was thinking, oh, I got some pretty good things to offer here. <laughs> so uh, Prabhupada said, so what is this? And I got out the book cover, and I tried to say that I got in this book uh, cover, it's to the cover of Prabhupada's Bhagavatam, because I heard him say that in the morning that he shouldn't touch it to the floor. And Prabhupada said, I did not touch my Bhagavatam to the floor. Very serious. He would be very stern when he was serious. And then I tried to explain repeatedly, I tried to say, but I meant, or I mean, or I meant to say, but every time I said, I mean, or started to speak, Prabhupada spoke again before me. I am not keeping my Bhagavatam on the floor. And then I said, but I mean, I am keeping my Bhagavatam on the shelf or on the table. <laughs> I'm trying to keep a serious face, but he was very serious. And, and all the devotees started laughing in the room. They were laughing and laughing. If you hear the tape, they <clears throat> you hear them laughing really hard, particularly Chiru. And uh, I was like, <laughs> I was totally embarrassed. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. The prophet wasn't going to let me explain it. So I just decided, oh, I'm going to just, just sit here and take this, whatever happens. And the prophet said, that is for you. So now I was like, oh, I didn't think I had many nice gifts now. <laughs> I was really embarrassed. And uh, so then I uh, pulled out the scarf and was hoping that when something came out of the box, I wasn't going to get something like that as a reaction. And uh, I gave him the scarf and said, that's nice. It's, and then, then I reached in and I pulled out the mangoes. And by now I was, you could say I was in a pretty humble state. I was not thinking, you know, I was thinking, oh boy, I don't know if was going to like any of these things. And then I brought out the mangoes. And then Prabhupada's mood changed. He said, ah, mango is the king of fruit. He said, this is a gift. And he smiled, you know, this is a gift. <laughs> and then I put the mangoes on his table there. He asked his, uh, he asked Deepak, who was cooking for him, he said, to put the mango in the milk that night, make mango milk. He said they can dry it and you can keep it and put it in milk. It's very nutritious. One time we were, I think it was myself and Pusta Krishna and Achyutananda in Mayapur, and we were talking about, you know, consciousness and whether every living being is conscious or not. And um, Achyutananda was trying to argue that actually they're not. The soul may be there, but the consciousness is not displayed. And he said, if you start thinking that every living being is conscious, then you'll go crazy. Because then you'll think, well, all the atoms in the floor are conscious. So if I tread on the floor, it'll hurt them. Or if I close the door too hard, you know, they'll, they'll all scream or something. So I was not really satisfied with, you know, his reply to that. And so I went straight in to see Srila Prabhupada and I asked him about it. And then Prabhupada was able to immediately point out a verse in the first canto. And then he gave me this example of how, you know, there's the skin and the nail. So if you cut the skin, then immediately you, you're hurt. But if you cut the nail, you can do that uh, without any difficulty. So he you know, he gave that as an example of how there are different states coming from the same source, 
but there are different states and uh, therefore everything is actually, you know, it's Krishna. Everything is Krishna, but Krishna's energies work in different ways. So matter, spirit is actually the same, it's from the same source, but uh, according to how it's used. So that was one question I was able to get cleared up there. In Bombay I was cooking uh, Prabhupada's, or cleaning after the, the breakfast, and I helped Diva Shakti. I made Prabhupada's breakfast, and then I was cleaning up, and and that was um, it was all. I was trying to do it really quietly, and then Prabhupada was going to take rest after that. For some reason, he was going to take rest, so I took a long time to clean up. I wanted to do it nicely, and then all of a sudden, I noticed it was really quiet in the, in his apartment. And it was so quiet, and I thought, gee, you know, it's really quiet, and Prabhupada must be taking rest. So I went to go out of the apartment in Bombay. It was on the third floor, and I was locked in, and I was just totally terrified that I was locked in with Prabhupada, who was a sannyasi, and the, the servant was gone, and I couldn't get out. And I thought, if Prabhupada wakes up and finds me here after he's taken his rest, I'll, I'll be in such big trouble. And I thought, you know, I was like this panic thing, what am I going to do? Eventually, I sort of went out onto the balcony and, you know, was waiting for someone to walk by and I'd see someone walk by, help, can you get someone to let me out? You know, I didn't want to wake Prabhupada up, so I thought, oh, you know, and this, was the, and this was the second time that had happened because when I was in Sydney, in, uh, I went to clean, they took me over to clean the apartment while Prabhupada went for his morning walk. And so, lo and behold, um, Prabhupada came back untimely, quickly. He came back to get something, then he was going back to the temple, so they all... So I think it was Vegavan who came in and sort of, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm just cleaning, you know. He said, you can't be here or something he was saying. I didn't know what was going on and sort of shoveled me behind the door, you know, and said, wait here, no problem. It's not supposed to see you. He's going to get changed or something. I thought, yes, yeah, so I'm standing behind the door like this, you know. And I'm thinking, what do I do now, you know. And I could see Prabhupada was taking his jumper off through the crack. I thought, oh, no, I can see him getting chased. And I think, you know, they just left me here like this. Uh, you know. And so anyway, all of a sudden the whole fanfare went out through the door and off and I'm left behind the door, you know, I think, will I come out? Well, they just left me there. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I thought, oh, well, oh, well, you know, okay, okay. <laughs> so I thought, no, you know, so it's just, I have this sort of leader of getting locked in private quarters and, you know, not supposed to be there and, you know, it's just like the story of... Uh, yeah, this is really, it was hard for women in those days because it was always like you were never supposed to be anywhere but at the same time you're supposed to do all these things, you know. <laughs> and you're always supposed to be invisible. But <laughs> so it was really funny. Actually, actually um, before, um, when I heard I had to speak this morning, I have to tell you this one. Um, and Bigger said to me, you, you, you know, it's us three, we've got to say something. And I said, oh, no, I said... Because this morning we were sort of lamenting, oh, we're at the back of the temple again, you know, and you go over there, we're so liberated because we've all got one side for the women, one side for me here, and here it's really right wing in Melbourne. And, <laughs> you know, we're all down the back, and I said, I said, you know, well, they push us all down the back, and as soon as they need us for something, here we are up the front having to speak again, you know. Oh, I thought it was just a really funny thing. <laughs> and Rookie said, yes, you say that when you get up there, so for, for Rook Babati, I say that. He, uh, he, yeah, Prabhupada went to Prabhupada went to Scotland for the opening of the temple, and um, it was quite an interesting press conference. All these sort of, um, you know, weary, hard-edged kind of journalists, cynical journalists, mostly, had assembled from various Scottish newspapers, and Prabhupada had a connection with Scotland that most people were kind of weren't aware of at that time. That in fact he was educated by Scottish missionaries in Calcutta, the school he attended. So he, he knew a bit more about Scottish people in Scotland than we thought he might know. And I think the press people might have had an idea about that. So there was, I, I remember it quite well because we were in his room. It was quite a small room, but there might have been 10 or 15 journalists there, and, along with maybe 8 or 10 of devotees. And they were asking these questions. They were type, sort of cynical kind of questions. Uh, some of them were almost rude like challenging, why have you come here, what purpose are you doing, uh, what do you hope to achieve, that kind of thing. And Prabhupada answered very, very, very nicely, he maintained his composure completely and he gave 
you know, eloquent answers and quoted a bit from the Bhagavad Gita. And um, in a sense, they, they, they were becoming won over, as most people usually were, it didn't take very long. And one of the, one of the journalists, I'll never forget this, he, he became so either frustrated or, or um, didn't quite know what to ask Prabhupada in a kind of an offhand manner. He asked Prabhupada, he said, so do you know everything like that? And Prabhupada kind of took his time to answer and he nodded his head and he said yes. And, but then he kind of, he didn't just say yes like that, obviously he purported it a bit, he, he, he added a little something to it. But that was a classical moment, you know, where that question was asked of him and he thought and he answered directly and honestly and he just said yes. And at that, at that moment there was like a, a feeling right throughout the room amongst the devotees and amongst the journalists that, you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps it, was, uh, it was true. I mean, and, and after that the whole mood changed, they became very light-hearted. We were walking back from that square near the British Museum and there were only, there were only a few devotees there. There, there, was, there were only about uh, two or three devotees with Prabhupada. Um, and I just, it had been on my mind for some reason or other, so I, I just said, to, does the Pope make spiritual advancement? And he answered immediately and said, yes, because he's engaged in God's work. And we'd heard stories about um, the Pope doesn't follow the regulative principles or anything like this. Um, so it was quite a surprise. But he was very definite about that, that he was engaged in God's work. And I thought about that for many, many years actually. Um, it's quite an interesting subject. So. <clears throat> when I was in Australia, Srila Prabhupada was not very available to most of the devotees. But uh, when I went to Bombay in the beginning of 1974, Prabhupada passed through many, many times. Whenever he was going around the world, he'd come through Bombay to see how the construction was going. And there were so many problems associated with Bombay. So uh, the, the mood of Srila Prabhupada in Bombay in India was very different from when he was in Australia. Even his cloth, you know, he would just wear the loose top and be very relaxed. And devotees could freely access Sula Prabhupada. And every night that Prabhupada was in Bombay, he would have a darshan on his roof. And Prabhupada would go up there and sometimes he'd go up and there'd be nobody there, just a servant with Prabhupada or someone fanning Prabhupada or sometimes he'd be sitting alone. And so he'd, just, he'd be chanting, so you could sit and chant with Prabhupada and any questions you could ask. And then slowly, slowly guests would come, Indian guests and devotees, and it would become quite packed. So that was every day Prabhupada uh, had, you know, this more, more, there was more freedom with Srila Prabhupada there. And he had many uh, film stars come, big industrialists, many people would come. And he was always so warm and welcoming, and uh, they would come and sit right at the front, he'd bring them up the front, and then he would start preaching to them straight away. And uh, I remember once there was this old man that used to come and he just lived down the road on the way in between the temple and the beach and he had some disease where he used to shake his, his fingers, his hands and head used to shake all the time. So he used to come and he used to visit Sula Prabhupada and he didn't do much, you know, he would just go up to Prabhupada's room and sort of sit there and say a few pleasantries and sort of sit and shake there. <laughs> He'd talk sometimes to Srila Prabhupada but his servant, I don't know who he was at the time, stopped him coming because he thought, oh he's just wasting Prabhupada's time. And so the old man thought, oh I shouldn't go, he was really humble. And so he didn't go anymore to see Prabhupada and then one day after a long time there were many devotees there, he came in and he offered obeisances. He was very old and um, Prabhupada said, oh, where have you been? Why haven't you been coming? And um, he said, oh, Prabhupada, they told me not to come. And Prabhupada said, you can come at any time. And he chastised the servants, you know, and said, let him come at any time. So I thought that was really wonderful of Srila Prabhupada because his work was so important, his translating work, and, you know, there was no immediate benefit that you could see from this old gentleman coming in front of Prabhupada. And, 
sitting, taking his time, but, but Sula Prabhupada was so free, you know, there with his time. Anybody who wanted could go see Prabhupada. We were walking amongst the trees and Srila Prabhupada commented, why don't they uh, grow some fruit trees here? If they had fruit trees then it would bring the birds. And that struck me as being pretty amazing. Who, who thinks of birds? Uh, but he was aware of uh, so, so many different levels of what we understand to be reality. And then he, then he asked, why do they have all these big buildings? Wouldn't it be nice if they, if they weren't there or something similar? But why do they have these big buildings? You could see from the gardens the skyline of these big tall buildings. And, uh, and no one answered the question. So being an artist is that sort of uh, attachment that whatever you create stays after you're gone. So I said to Srila Prabhupada in response to his question, well, I guess they want to leave something behind them, something that, that showed they were here. And he said, yes, this is exactly like the, the washerman's donkey, that he feels very proud to have all this washing on his back. The same principle. I, I can remember that to this day. Uh, After Prabhupada went back to the temple, actually, he didn't go there. We, we, we had a, a house for him this time. And uh, it was a, a Griasta couple, their house, and they'd moved out and let Prabhupada come into that house and let Prabhupada stay there during his visit. Now, it was, uh, this house was kind of a, a modest house in a you know, modest suburb uh, near the temple, not very far from the temple. And uh, when, when Prabhupada uh, arrived there, <coughs> he uh, uh, came out and he, and he walked in and he walked through the, the house and walked through the rooms and he says, Oh, very nice house. He said, uh, how many families live here? And Ugashrava, who was uh, the devotee who lived there, he said, oh, only, only one family, Prabhupada. He said, oh, gotcha, only one family. One family, such a big house. <laughs> so, well, I mean, from Western standards, it was nothing but for Prabhupada. So, once, you know, just, just previously, he was saying that a Rolls Royce is not enough. I said, Krishna has the golden chariot. <laughs> And then, then when we just take him to a modest house, he's saying that, uh, well, it's such a big house, how many families live here? And, uh, and uh, the next year I remember that when we first opened our new temple here at, uh, in Melbourne, that uh, when we brought Prabhupada up the stairs, we just finished renovating everything. The devotee's been working hard for weeks and weeks, and months actually, and uh, <clears throat> brought Prabhupada upstairs and we showed him his quarters, which were quite well furnished and, and parquet floor and uh, chandeliers and low desk for Prabhupada's working and and uh, we opened the door and and uh, I think Madhavisa said uh, <coughs> Prabhupada this is your room and uh, Prabhupada said uh, what all, all this for me this is all mine <laughs> so, and then we took him next door to his bedroom which was a separate room and, uh, and Prabhupada said, oh, I have a bedroom also. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just, uh, Prabhupada's personality was, uh, uh, you know, materialists generally, they, they portray a certain type of mood and attitude and they generally live on that level. And they don't, you don't see very many other sides to them. But Prabhupada, you know, and I, I didn't see that many sides to Prabhupada, or I didn't have that much intimate contact with Prabhupada, but... The, the, the sides I did see to Prabhupada showed that how it, it was uh, inex, inexplicable on the, on the ordinary level that in one sense, you know, he's accepting a Rolls Royce and another he's saying, oh, all this is for me. You know, it's something that's uh, <coughs> a quandary, really. I mean, you know, a, a materialist couldn't understand it, but we understood it because we were devotees, he was our spiritual master, we, we understood Prabhupada's transcendental position. So at that time, Prabhupada got out of the car and Upananda came out, running out of the temple and paid his obeisances and Prabhupada patted Upananda on the head very affectionately. And we were having a kirtan. Actually, I was getting out the car. There was a group of devotees having a kirtan on the, on the sidewalk. The, the front door of the temple had blown close, closed. So uh, Prabhupada reached to open the front door of the temple and it was locked from the inside. Uh, at that time, my mother and father, I had invited them apparently it, there was some mix-up in the, in the recollections, but I think before we went to the airport, there must have been some prior notification that Prabhupada was coming, but I think it was 
I think it was, it was rather muddled, but I think uh, at least we'd had the opportunity to invite some press to the temple. Uh, and somehow or other I'd also invited my parents to come. So when Prabhupada went to open the door, it was closed. My father was feeling very embarrassed about being seen with the Hare Krishnas on the street. And uh, he was, him and my mother were there only under duress. Uh, I'm surprised that they even came, but they came and my father pulled open the little uh, curtain and he saw Prabhupada open, trying to get in. So my father opened the door and uh, as Prabhupada went in the door, Prabhupada nodded at my father uh, to say thank you. And then Prabhupada sat down on a very small Vyasasana, looked around the room at all the devotees present. At that time, there were a few guests. One of those guests was Bhakta Arthur. He's not here to recall this incident. But Bhakta Arthur recalls, Bhakta Arthur was a, a, a boxer for the, for the South Sydney Leagues Club. And he was a pretty tough guy. And uh, he was a, a carpet layer. And uh, he had his, a carpet laying business. He was a pretty tough sort of guy. And Prabhupada looked around the room and then his eyes stopped and looked at Arthur. So Arthur thought, well, I'm going to look back. <laughs> so Arthur was looking at Prabhupada in the eye and Prabhupada was looking at Bhakta Arthur. And Bhakta Arthur recalled that he was looking and looking and looking and it got to the point Prabhupada's gaze was so intense that he had to, uh, he had to eventually look away. But he recalls that gaze of Prabhupada, and it was a, it was a look of, of uh, it was a, an affectionate but a very grave glance at the same time. And back to Arthur, who later became Ajamil, um, he recalled how this glance, uh, it, it seemed like this glance was what brought him closer to Krishna consciousness. Along with that glance came all the blessings of the, of, of Srila Prabhupada and the disciplic succession. He felt impregnated with something very spiritual at that time. Here in Melbourne, uh, one, one time Prabhupada was uh, walking through the park and he stopped and he said, uh, all sound is transcendental to a pure devotee. So we just pondered that and walked on. And I couldn't, re I couldn't resist it. I just said, Shiva Prabhupada, are you saying these car horns, we can hear beep, beep, you can hear them in the back, beep, beep. Are you saying these car horns can be transcendental to a pure devotee? I probably said yes. There were a lot of times in Perth, particularly sometimes in Melbourne, I've even seen on film that I didn't remember asking Prabhupada about the, all the. Uh, one case I was trying to understand the 8,400,000 species of life, and I asked Prabhupada how they, those 8 million animal f forms of human, 400,000 human, are they on this planet or are they? divided by countries, does it mean the Chinese, the Japanese, the Americans, something like that. And Prabhupada said, no, you're thinking of this planet, but the Srimad Bhagavatam is speaking of the entire universe, the whole universe. Uh, Prabhupada would like to walk <coughs> out in the open, and, you know, especially here in, uh, in, uh, in Melbourne, and, and uh, Melbourne and also Sydney, he liked to go to parks a lot. And we took him to the botanical, uh, botanical gardens here in Melbourne, which are quite famous, he's, he's, he thought that, <coughs> actually he made a statement that the Botanical Garden in Melbourne is better than New York Central Park. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and he li very much liked it. And I, I was quite amazed that when Prophet walked through the park, he, he knew a lot of things that w to, to, would, would seem a person in his position perhaps wouldn't bother even speaking about, like, uh, you know, what, what, what the names of the trees were. <laughs> And, it, you know, Prabhupada would walk and uh, he, he would uh, he'd say, uh, this is a such and such tree. And, uh, and then he said, go and, go and have a look. Because in the, in the park, all the trees had little kind of name tags. So he'd send someone over and then, <coughs> then the person, then the voter would come over and, and he'd quote that it was in Latin. They'd have it, the Latin name there. And then and he said, what is that? And he said, such and such in Latin. And he said, but what, in English? And he said, yes, yes, just see. <laughs> So we would walk along like that. And that, that, that kind of surprised me. Oh, proper, just he knows all these things. He knew about trees, he knew about flowers. You know, he very much appreci appreciated uh, the beauty of the park. Also, I remember another time when we were walking, he, he, we were walking, it was early in the morning, I guess it was about six o'clock, and uh, uh, 
Prabhupada saw that the uh, actually Prabhupada saw that even at six o'clock there was heavy traffic going into the city because these these gardens were really close to the city. There was heavy traffic going into the city, and uh, <coughs> Prabhupada said, "What's what is this traffic?" And uh, someone said, uh, "Oh, they're all going to work, Prabhupada." And Prabhupada said, he stopped and he, uh, he was silent he, and he just said, "They are working so hard," and I could see his eye was a little moist, you know, just. The stage before a, a tear would come, he felt. I, I just you could feel that he felt so much compassion for these people that he was concerned that they were even early in the morning at six o'clock they were racing and rushing into work. And so they were working so hard. And then another time, he I, actually I think it was that same morning he saw that some of the businessmen were driving their cars and then parking them right out at the botanical gardens, which was about three or four kilometres from the city. So he was asking, why do they, uh, what are they doing? And someone explained that proper, they, they, they park their cars here so they, they can avoid paying parking fees in the city. And proper said, just see. He said, then he gave a, a story, he said, a man can ride in a big carriage, but he can't afford, afford to feed the horses. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, <laughs> everyone laughed, and it was so poignant at that point that he, here we are—you know, someone driving a big car, big businessman wearing a suit and tie and a briefcase and everything—and then they park the car outside and have to walk three or four kilometres into the city to go to the office. And when we cleaned his quarters, we would always change his sheets, and and Proverbs stopped that. He said, "You don't change them every day; you just change when they're dirty." And um, of course, they were never dirty, but. You know, Prabhupada wanted that. And uh, another thing, <coughs> he used to have a garland, his fresh garland. He had a picture of Radha and Krishna on his little table. And after he'd come back from his morning class and everything, he'd take off that garland and put it on a picture of Radha and Krishna on his desk. But we weren't allowed to throw it out. And on the wall there was the disciple of succession, Bhaktisiddhanta, Gaurakishore and Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So, after the garland had been on the deity picture, we would take it off so that he could put the fresh one on and then we'd place it on Bhaktisiddhanta's picture and then the next day we'd move it down to Gorkishore's picture. We'd be moving them all along and then down to Bhaktivinotakwa's picture and finally we could take it as prasadam. So Prabhupada was very particular about things like that. So one day I had this Bhaktivinotakwa's garland on which you can imagine in the Bombay sun was quite shriveled. You know. So that day I started to think, oh gee, Prabhupada doesn't really know me and he knows so many devotees so well and you know, he hardly knows me and I was feeling you know, a little bad that I don't get to do very much for Siddha Prabhupada. And, and uh, I was making his vases, which I did every day, and I used to take them up at 11 o'clock. At that time Prabhupada was always having his massage. So that day, the very day I'd been thinking that, I went upstairs and Prabhupada was in his room. So I stopped in fear, in awe, you know. And then I walked in, I put the vases down and offered obeisances and I was flustered and I was trying to back out of the room. And Prabhupada, he looked at that old garland and he said, where from you got this garland? And he said, here, you take this one. And he reached down and he took the fresh garland from that morning that he just put over the picture of the deities and he gave it to me. Oh, so I, f I felt so happy and, and I realised that Prabhupada, he knows what we need. He knows exactly what we need in spiritual life and it was just so much encouragement from Sula Prabhupada. Then I felt also foolish that I'd had to, that I'd had to think like that and that Prabhupada had had to cater to me but still, it was very treasured for me, you know, that that had happened. For Prabhupada's second visit to Melbourne, uh, for Prabhupada's second visit to Australia, Prabhupada was uh, coming to Melbourne for the first time. And um, when Prabhupada arrived at the temple, I do recall Krishna Premi was crying. Uh, and uh, she was trying to sing, she was trying to sing Vande Hum, Sri Guru, on harmonium. Uh, and, and crying at the same time and uh, it was quite an intense affair but it was very 
it was done with great affection and uh, sincerity, and Prabhupada nodded and smiled at Krishna Premi. And I remember uh, Upananda had made a big plate of uh, Simply Wonderfuls, which was uh, the number one delicacy in those days. Somehow or other, uh, Simply Wonderfuls were like the sum and bonum of life. Uh, some devotees made their own Simply Wonderfuls <coughs> on, the, on the side. Um, <laughs> Ajamil was famous. Uh, he got Gorangi, Raghunath's wife, to make him an extra large bead bag. And uh, we, weren't sh we, we weren't sure the reason behind it until one day I discovered that inside Ajamil's bead bag, along with his beads, was a, a small packet of sunshine powdered milk, a, a packet of butter, and a packet of icing sugar. So Ajamil sometimes used to sneak out the back and, and roll his own. <laughs> So we were very addicted to Simply Wonderfuls and Upananda had made these Simply Wonderfuls and we, he offered a plate to Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada, I don't think he took any but he nodded as if, and then he made a gesture to distribute the Simply Wonderfuls to everyone. I was very much into rules and regulations. I was very uh, pedantic in those days and probably the best man for being the temple commander, although I must have offended probably every devotee in Australia. <laughs> But I, all I could think of was at the time when, when the Simply Wonderfuls were coming around, I was thinking, but we just read in the Nectar of Devotion a couple of days ago that we shouldn't eat in front of the deity. So I was thinking, maybe, maybe this is an offence. But I saw everyone else eat their Simply Wonderfuls and I was very perplexed. I was thinking, perhaps we're all committing a great offence here. But in fact, of course, taking prasadam from Srila Prabhupada is uh, uh, beyond any rules and regulations. I remember one thing that he said really affected me. Um, he asked Dupendra, are you, reading my, are, you, are you studying my books? And Dupendra said, yes, Prabhupada, I read your books every day. And Prabhupada thumped the desk. You read my books, but I said, do you study my books? And Prabhupada was emphatic. He said, you must know the meaning of every word. If you learn a verse, don't just, don't just learn the verse. Like, you must know the meaning of every word. And he was very emphatic. I said, study. The difference between studying and reading. So I took that, I took a little bit to heart at the time. I know Prabhupada wasn't very keen on our men making movies. You know, there was a discussion that Gyanagamya had with him in Iran um, in August of 76. And he was very keen on that at that time of making a big commercial full scale movie. You know, you, the millions of dollars thing. And he had this idea that somehow or another it would popularize the movement. Uh, his idea was to show some scenario where the devotees were involved and people could see how we lived and get an appreciation from that. Prabhupada dismissed it. Uh, he, so, you know, Gyanagamya brought up five or six different angles. He was desperately trying to get a, a yes from Prabhupada, but Prabhupada would not give him an endorsement for it at all. And he said, for the kind of money that you're spending, this was one of the arguments that he used. He said, the kind of money that you would spend on that, he said, how many books could you distribute? He said, and I have personal experience anyway, expending so much money and getting practically no result. He said, when I first went to New York, he said, then I put an ad classified in the New York Times. So he said, at that time, it cost me so much money, I had practically nothing. For one small ad, it ran for, th uh, you know, one or two days or something. He said, I got three responses, and none of them bought my books. So he said, I have personal experience. This is, you know, a waste of time. <laughs> well, I mean, as far as movies go as well, because in India, you can make movies about Krishna. And they've done it uh, very often. But, you know, they always want to focus in on Krishna's 10th canto, you know, gopi leelas and things like this. So I remember um, when we were in Bhubaneswa, this was in uh, late January and very early February of 77. So this movie maker came, two or three of them came, and they explained to Srila Prabhupada that we're making a movie, we want to popularize Krishna's pastimes. Now Hare Krishna is becoming very popular, and we want that everybody should know about Krishna, and uh, we want to show Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes. 
And so, you know, we'd like, you know, you are the guru of the Hare Krishna movement. So we would like to get your blessings for making this movie. And we'd also like to just put a little mention of our humble thanks, you know, for the work that you've done in popularizing Krishna's pastimes on the movie. So Prabhupada immediately, you know, told them no. He said, why, why do you want to immediately jump to Krishna's 10th canto pastimes? So they were saying, but Swamiji, everybody in India is a Krishna Bhakta. And Prabhupada told him, he said, nobody will understand. You'll show them and they'll take it as some mythology. You know, Krishna <coughs> being, uh, killing the Trinavata whirlwind or whatever. He said, then they'll all think it's simply mythology. So then they, but they said, oh, but Swamiji, everybody in India, they're all Krishna Bhaktas. So the evening before, Prabhupada had had a conversation with a man who had asked him, actually, who is Krishna? Prabhupada was shocked. He's an Indian man, <laughs> supposed to be educated, asking who is Krishna, and he chastised him like anything. He was in a, in a darshan. And Prabhupada said, you're born in India, or you do not know who is Krishna? And then when he had given his evening lecture, he brought it up in the lecture also, that, you know, here we are in uh, Punya Bhumi, you know, in, in, in Bharata Bhumi, and now people are so degraded that they're asking who is Krishna? So now this film man came a day or two later, and he said, oh, but Swamiji, everybody's a Krishna Bhakta. Prabhupada said, you say that they're Krishna Bhaktas, but he is asking, who is Krishna? So he said, why don't you make a movie of the first canto? You show that first, and then progress. You go progressively through the Bhagavatam, and then you can do the tenth canto. But of course, you know, they wanted the tenth canto, Krishna with the Galpias and this and that. But Prabhupada would not give them an endorsement because they were simply trying to, you know, capitalize on Prabhupada's popularity. Oh, this movie is approved by Bhaktivedanta Swami. But Prabhupada would not give him an, impro uh, an approval. And after about half an hour, you know, again, they brought up various arguments. Prabhupada would not give a budge an inch on it. He refused. He said, if you make one of the first canto, then we'll see. <laughs> uh, at different times, we were playing the materialist in the morning walks, and then some time would pass. So at one point, Ganesh Prabhu, he posed a question, but it wasn't in a context where one could see that this was uh, posing as materialist. And he was just asked, if the, he said, Srila Prabhupada, if the Bhagavad Gita is 5,000 years old, and Prabhupada said, what? Bhagavad Gita is not 5,000 years old. Have you read Bhagavad Gita? He says, yes, a little then you should know. You're a student of Bhagavad Gita, and you think it was written 5,000 years ago? And he started to walk. He said, Millions of years, Bhagavad Gita, you know, he began to explain. They stopped and said, you should know. <laughs> that was, he was getting really heavily chastised. But uh, then I said, I think maybe he was posing as a materialist, Prabhupada. <laughs> I said, yeah, even so, one should know Bhagavad Gita was not written 5,000 years ago. Now, another time I remember going for a morning walk was uh, <clears throat> where Prabhupada, we were walking and uh, actually Prabhupada used to uh, walk and he would exchange greetings even with, with kamis. Uh, uh, you know, he, someone would walk and someone would say hello and he, sometimes he would just say hello. Was he would say, good morning. <laughs> well, other times he would say, Hare Krishna. One time uh, I remember a group of joggers jogged through. There was about half a dozen, like, maybe they were some club, part of some club or something. They were jogging through. And after they jogged through, making very loud kind of sound, you know, stomping with their, their uh, sand shoes and breathing heavily. And Prabhupada stopped and he turned around to all of us. <laughs> he said, uh, they are thinking they're by this exercise, they are increasing their life. But they do not know that with every breath, one only has a certain number of breaths in the life. Because they're exercising very hard and breathing more rapidly, actually, they're decreasing their life. <laughs> so they are thinking with exercise, they are increasing, but actually they are decreasing. 
So uh, these are some of the things that I, I remember from uh, Prabhupada walking. Another time when we were just before we got this present uh, temple we're in now, we took a Prabhupada for a morning walk, uh, walk along the beachfront, which is just near here. And uh, uh, we were showing Prabhupada premises we were, we, we, we'd been living before that time in a really small temple, you know, just four or five kilometers from here. And uh, it was so small that, you know, we didn't, hardly anyone could fit in there. So we were looking to buy another place. And so we we're showing Prabhupada this place we were thinking about, and it was this huge uh, kind of monastery or something. You know, the, some nuns were using it. I forget the name of the particular order. But, uh, uh, and it was this, this huge, probably like, a, like a, right on the beachfront road, which is one of the main arteries in the city, and it had a big, huge wall on the boundary, and you could, you could see over the wall and the, 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 uh, the convent and the uh, chapel and all the other buildings. It had a, a large number of uh, buildings on the property itself. So at that time, I think they wanted like <clears throat> over a million dollars, which back then was oh, a lot of money. I mean, it must have been at least 10 million these days. So, you know, I'm thinking, you know, someone, someone had the idea or a few devotees had the idea, maybe perhaps, you know, we should try to get this property. And I'm thinking, we'll never be able to afford this. They want to open a million dollars anyway. Somehow or other, we were showing Prabhupada. So we were going on the morning walk and... <clears throat> I think Madhavisa and uh, um, someone else were, they were talking about the proper was asking questions and the witness Madhavisa said, oh, we're thinking of buying this property, Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, and he stopped. And he was silent. Then he started walking again, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And then he asked, started asking, well, <clears throat> so, what is their asking price? Everyone stopped. Well, they want over a million dollars. I, I thought that when Prabhupada heard that, he just, he would say, oh, yes. no, we, no possibility of getting this property, but he was very serious. <clears throat> and he kept asking different questions as we were walking. So I, 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 I could see from that, I learned from that, that nothing was outside of the scope of Prabhupada's plan. And uh, we, we didn't know how, we didn't have any money, <laughs> not, not that type of money anyway, but uh, Prabhupada was serious. And later on, he, uh, uh, he asked to uh, see the inside grounds and walk through the buildings. Uh, so that, that was arranged, and he was walking through. Later on, after that <clears throat> visit, we learned that these particular, this particular order would only sell us the property if we, we would demolish the chapel. They didn't want us to use the chapel. So Prabhupada said, let them demolish it. We, we won't demolish the chapel. How is this? He said, if they want to demolish it, just seize it. They can demolish it, but we'll never demolish it. Later on, because they refused to sell us that property uh, except for that condition, uh, we informed Prabhupada after. This was after he'd left. We informed Prabhupada that it was not possible really to get that property. So later, later we, got, we were looking at this property we're in now and uh, we told Prabhupada that it was smaller. And then Prabhupada says, well, sometimes smaller is better. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he came and uh, opened this uh, temple here and he was very uh, pleased by that. When Prabhupada first came to New Zealand, um, we met him at the airport and he came into his room and he was seated behind his desk and I sort of sat before him pretty much like this where I was just seated in front of Srila Prabhupada and some sannyasis were over in the other corner and um, I just straight away, because we've been preparing for so long for making a new altar, carving Jagannath deities, you know, getting Gorni Thai, I brought Gorni Thai personally back from India at a great difficulty because I have a great big deity brass deed I had to carry them and um, so we were looking forward to this and I said Srila Prabhupada we can install um, Gorni Thaitis and Janati and Prabhupada, Prabhupada sort of sat there looking at me and after a while he sort of he didn't, he didn't look at me he wouldn't wouldn't look at me but he looked over at the sannyasis and he said uh, dolls just dolls he is thinking they are simply dolls, idols, that's all. 
And um, uh, so I, I, I was sort of a little bit shocked because I wasn't actually thinking like that. So then Prabhupada said, why do you want to install? And I said, well, um, it is Lord Chaitanya's movement. I think we should worship Gorni Thai. And our Jagannath, the Yishila Prabhupada, is six inches tall. If we have Rath Yatra, who will see them? And so Prabhupada went, hmm, just like that. So the next morning, we went, we, we went down to greet the deities and um, we opened the curtains and Prabhupada saw that I actually built an altar. He must have just thought, well, this guy's really spaced out, you know, like that. And Prabhupada turned around to me and he said, oh, so you've made preparation. So you've actually, this is not just some idea. So you've made some preparation. Oh, yes, we will install Guru Garanga and Jagannath, Balaram Sabad. So, but... Uh, all that night I was very um, tossing and turning, wondering what to do. So when we actually installed the deities, um, as soon as the curtains opened, Prabhupada said to the Pajari, shut the curtains. So I went up to Prabhupada and I said, well, what's wrong? He said, Gorni I have no crowns. So I went, I went back into the, into the D room and I didn't know what to do because Gorni Tai did not, we just, I hadn't got crowns together for Gorni Thai, so I managed to find a couple of bangles like this um, from Radha and Krishna, and I just I, 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 I put some blue tack and a brooch on the bangle and put it on Gorni Thai's head like that, and then just opened the curtains. So then Shri Prabhupada was still standing there, and I sort of went up and, and sort of said, is that all right? <laughs> and Guru Creeper went bang, punched me in the chest really hard, really hard. And just as I was choking for breath, Srila Prabhupada leaned over and said, and now you must have Rathi Yatra. <laughs> so, um, every one of those words stays in my mind. One, one young girl, Brahmacharini, uh, put up her hand and everyone you know, in the room looked, oh yes, someone's going to ask a question. And I, I don't think it was even relevant to the, qu to the class at the time. And it, she said, Srila Prabhupada, does Krishna speak the Bhagavad Gita in the hellish planets? So Prabhupada, you know, he thought for a moment, and he looked back and he said, hellish planets? Hellish planets? You don't think this London is a hellish planet? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, everybody thought that was quite funny. I mean... It was quite funny. It was an excellent way of answering the question because it answered the question, but also enlightened us to think that, uh, you know, what is our position? Yeah, so that's one, you know, one question that uh, stuck, sticks in my mind. Of course, another time we refer to England as a green hell, <laughs> which is quite, you know, it's a wonderful use of the English language, you know, to describe Britain or England in that way, which is quite, a, quite an apt way to describe it. One of the morning walks in Perth uh, that I remember the most was uh, in a particular park. I forget the name now. And uh, I probably won't be able to remember all the conversation. You can see it in the conversation transcriptions. But uh, I asked Prabhupada, because when we're preaching, sometimes people say, you say that Krishna consciousness is a science, but we think it's a belief. Why, why do you call it a science? And Prabhupada said, if you can call your science, if you can call your beliefs science, then we can call our beliefs science. Because what you're calling science is really just belief. For example, you believe that the living entity comes from matter, from chemicals. But where is the evidence? Where is the, the uh, example of a living entity coming from matter, from chemicals? So you're, it's simply a belief, and you're calling it science. So if you call your belief science, then we can call our belief science. But it went on. It was a very interesting conversation. I, I asked Prabhupada a couple of instructions. Oh, actually, Prabhupada told me what, I used to dress Radha Rasabihari, and I had put a, a red Ramanuja-type tilak thing inside Krishna's tilak. And Prabhupada sent a message, you never to put anything in Krishna's tilak like that. Krishna's tilak should always be clear. And then another time I asked him about spices because he'd restricted spicing. And um, 
I asked him, well, can't we even use mustard seeds? He said, look, it's just uh, cumin seed and hing. It's sufficient, actually, for the deities. And he also, I asked him about Radharani's hair because there was some contention at the time in Bombay that um, Radharani's hair shouldn't be showing. It shouldn't be out. It should be tied back because she's the most chaste lady. But we often used to put her hair out. And, and um, so I asked Sula Prabhupada, can Radharani's hair be out or does it have to be tied back? And, and he said, whatever you think looks nice. So he wasn't strict on that. I was recommended for second initiation and we were asked to go out and collect dakshin. Uh, now, in those days, generally speaking, maybe there were some exceptions. We didn't usually come up with very much money. Uh, we used to go, I remember going to, along, Fort, along Burnett Street, knocking on the door of terraced houses and apartments and telling people that uh, tomorrow I'm going to be initiated by a bona fide spiritual master. Uh, I wondered if you could please give me some donation as an offering. So I came back with about 55 cents. <laughs> um, I put it on a saucer and uh, I brought it in with me. I remember Jagatarini also recalls collecting not much more than that. And um, somehow or other I thought that it wasn't, wasn't a bad collection. <laughs> I don't, but anyway, I, I tried pretty hard. Prabhupada, uh, when I came in the room, Prabhupada was, was lying on a chaise long. Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada often would uh, like to recline in the afternoons on chaise long, um, the long seats with the scrolled ends like we have in Prabhupada's room. The Brahmachari room in the Burnett Street temple had been transformed into Prabhupada's room. I remember Dormia Prabhu, his uh, parents had gone overseas, so he had raided the house and taken all the furniture out of the house. And we'd filled up Prabhupada's room with all this nice furniture including the chaise long. So Prabhupada didn't have a shirt on and he had his dhoti and of course Prabhupada had very soft golden skin which appeared to be you know, glowing and effulgent. We had a little chandelier on the ceiling. Uh, as we went in the door Prabhupada was lying, the chaise long was on the right hand side, his desk was on the left hand side of the room with his back towards the window leading onto the little veranda which overlooked the street. So Prabhupada was lying, on the sh reclining on the chaise long, I think on his left arm and Prabhupada asked me uh, to sit down in front of him and he showed me how to count on his, finger, on his fingers, how I should be counting on my fingers for the chanting of the Gayatri Mantra. Uh, I was very um, sure of myself at that point. I had been watching Upananda saying his Gayatri Mantra in the mornings and I would figured out how to count, or at least I thought I did. And I thought that the counting started from the top of the index finger. So I think when Prabhupada was showing me how to count, I wasn't watching very carefully. I was thinking, well, actually, I already know how to do this. I'll, I'll get it first time. So after Prabhupada showed me the counting, I attempted to count starting from the, my first tip of my first index finger. And Prabhupada shook his hand and said, no, no. And he showed me again. I started to, get to panic at this point, as was a common experience with many devotees when they were in the, in the room alone with Prabhupada. I'd never been in the room alone with Prabhupada and I was perspiring and shaking. Um, my eyes didn't seem to be working anymore and I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't focus. And uh, all of a sudden, it just felt like all my limbs had locked up and everything just went blank. And Prabhupada showed me again, and even though he was moving his fingers, everything was just hazy. And I tried again, and I got it wrong. And then I tried again, Prabhupada was getting very angry, and I got it wrong again. So then Prabhupada, he, show, he held my finger, my thumb down on my finger, and said, you have to start from here. <laughs> and he, he looked very disgust, disgusted, and I felt microscopic. <laughs> and um, he placed the sacred thread over my shoulder, and... Then I left the room. The devotees were, were trying to bring some important people to, to, to meet Prabhupada because he'd requested that. So, you know, like uh, uh, some uh, ministers of government, um, heads of departments, uh, um, ministers of religion, <coughs> and, uh, even uh, uh, I think a bishop came, and uh, someone from the Catholic Church, a high official from the Catholic Church, so Prabhupada was sitting and, and preaching to all these people. <clears throat> and then uh, someone brought in a gentleman. And he, uh, 
came into the room. I, I don't know. He, someone, someone announced he's such and such and gave his title. And, and he sat down and proper looked up. He was behind his desk. And so he said, you have any questions? So this, this man, he was, I was looking at him. And this man, he was just sitting there. And he was wide-eyed <clears throat> like that. He looked, he, he looked a little unstable, actually, to me. <laughs> he, looked wide. He, was, he didn't say anything. He was just silent. And uh, uh, Prabhupada just b began preaching to him. He didn't wait for any reply. I mean, the man was silent. He didn't say anything. So he probably just started preaching you know, about not the body, you know, very kind of basic or part and parcel of God. The name of God is Krishna. And he went on and on and on and on. Long time. And, and, and the man, the gentleman was just sitting there, didn't say anything. And then at the end, he had that same, that, that man had that same expression. <laughs> He's just wide eyed, just looking at Prabhupada like this. And uh, then Prabhupada stopped and he said, So, give him some prashadam. So, some devotee gave him, some, had some fruit or something like that. They thanked him for coming. He still didn't say anything. The whole time he didn't say anything. <laughs> and then they let him outside. <clears throat> then after he left Prabhupada, I turned to the devotees and said, that man was ghostly possessed. <laughs> and I've been thinking there's something strange with him, but Prabhupada immediately, he knew. But still, the, the wonder of it was that <clears throat> he just preached to him. He wasn't phased his condition or anything. I mean, he'd been brought in as a guest. And, and, and proper treated him as a guest, no matter what his condition was, and I could see that. And, th and then all other, you know, proper talked to many different types of people, and all of them he treated them as guests very cordially, very respectfully. Of course, one time there was a, a professor was invited, and he began to challenge, and uh, especially challenge the philosophy of Krishna consciousness and challenged the devotees, and I think Guru Kripa was there at the time, standing next to Prabhupada, and <clears throat> he protested. He said, look, you, you know, you're coming, and now we brought you to, to meet our spiritual master, and now, you, now you're, you're starting to insult him. And uh, Prabhupada wasn't saying anything at this point, and uh, just trying to think what... The exchange was, was quite dramatic that he said, um, that the professor said uh, something to the effect that uh, <clears throat> you don't, but you people pose yourself as knowing everything and then that, you know, he was talking to Guru Kripa and when, when, when he was talking to Guru Kripa and, and he started to, to take an insulting, insulting kind of uh, mood to, to Guru Kripa. And then Prabhupada responded back. He said, is it we opposing as knowing everything or you opposing as knowing everything? We are narrow or you are narrow? But then it was the, the moment was very tense. <laughs> there was a kind of a silence. But then just as that moment came, Proper just changed the whole mood around. I said, anyway, and then he started speaking very respectfully to him. And then by the end of the discussion, <laughs> this man went away, uh, very grateful that he came. Although in, in the beginning, obviously, he'd come to sort of challenge and he was a bit agitated by the devotees, and I think that was his, his mood when he, when he initially came to actually uh, challenge Prabhupada. But Prabhupada was so expert that he just changed his whole mood around. <laughs> he defeated his challenge, and simultaneously, this man went away respectful to Prabhupada. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> One day, Ganesh Prabhu, who was in Perth also, he brought his mother and his sister to meet Prabhupada. And uh, his mother is Hebrew, and she was feeling defensive that this is a confrontation. You're saying your religion is the truth, so that means you're saying mine's not the truth. And Prabhupada was reassuring her, saying, it doesn't matter whether one's Hebrew or Christian or Hindu or Jew. If one knows God, 
and loves God, then that is, that is the truth or the proper path. But still she was saying defensive things. And again he said, it doesn't matter, Hebrew, Hindu, Christian, Jew, if you know God and you love God, then that is the truth, that is the path or something like that. So then she became at ease and she was comfortable. She didn't feel challenged. She let her defenses down. <clears throat> and then Prabhupada, he had this certain m mood. When he, was, when he was in a certain mood, he would, his eyes would be very soft and he was very humble. And he said, so, can you tell me who God is? And then she turned all red and she looked down and it's like, oh, couldn't say anything about that. And then her daughter, Ganesha's sister, said, God is love or something like that. But then she realized that she was defensive and Prabhupada sort of disarmed her defense and then he just very humbly asked if she knew who God was because that was the point. If you know God, if you love God, then that's the truth. So do you know God? She didn't know anything. And then uh, Prabhupada began to explain that Krishna, who Krishna is, that he's Bhagavan, that he has unlimited beauty, unlimited wealth, unlimited strength, unlimited fame, unlimited renunciation. Advaitam achutam aladim alantarupam. He's the original person, and from him unlimited other forms of himself arise, and that he is eternally young, although he's the oldest. Adyan purana purusham navayovanamcha. He is the oldest of all. He's the original person, but he's eternally young. He never grows old. So then he was just telling her who, who God is. That was very nice to see the way Prabhupada dealt with her feelings and then just told her who Krishna was in such a way that she could listen. I, I particularly remember that he mentioned uh, on one show, some, there was some kind of Christian minister that was going around and really heavily criticizing us, and he was being invited to different talk shows. So he was criticizing us how we worship this man, you know, this mythological man who had sex with 16,000 wives. And, you know, he was trying to make out that actually the whole basis of our movement is immorality. It's a typical kind of thing that people think that Krishna is an ordinary man and that he's immoral. And so Prabhupada then very nicely, uh, very strongly, but very expertly explained how sex desire is there originally in the spiritual world. And for Krishna, sex is not bad. He's God. He enjoys everything. So why only 16,000? You know, he can enjoy 16 million. And for him it is not bad. But he said, for you it is bad. He said, you cannot have sex. You know, <laughs> and, you know attacking. This was Prabhupada's method. He would cut them down and, and give, you know, real philosophical reasons, but really punch them home as well. It was very strong. So he explained there that how, you know, the adiras, that's the original form of, of sex desire, the original rases that Krishna has in the spiritual world. But in the material world, when they imitate Krishna, then it becomes the most degraded. So for Krishna, what is the most highest uh, activity when it's reflected in the, pervertedly in the material world, it becomes the very lowest and the most degraded. And, um, you know, so that, that was one point, anyway, that he, that he explained there. Prabhupada, someone said, the Nam Hat know the whole five, fifth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. So Prabhupada says, so, he wanted to impress his, his life members. And suddenly the whole Nam Hat turned around and it was just me. I was the, I was the end of the room. <laughs> so I go, Yoga Yukta Vishudatma Vijitatma Jitendriya um, it was the first sloka out of the fifth chapter I could think of. And it sounded so lilting and sort of the, the tune sounded so bad. And, uh, but the life member, to sort of ease the embarrassment, said, very nice melody. And Prabhupada said, yes, very nice melody. Thank you very much. Sit down. But I was supposed to chant the whole fifth chapter. And we, or the whole Nam Hut was and we didn't do it. Prabhupada was very merciful, very tolerant. And one other time it was uh, Govardhan Puja. And Vishalani came and she learnt all the lines for Krishna and she dressed herself up in a dhoti and she put blue and 
She learnt the lines so nicely and she s spoke it all so enthusiastically that after the play, Srila Prabhupada got up off his Vyasa son and he walked around to her and uh, he took his garland off and put his garland on Vishalini and he folded his hands like that and bent down and did pranams to Vishalini. So he really appreciated what she had done. I was on Sankatan actually in pl plain clothes, sank doing plain clothes Sankatan. I came back and there was this kind of big crowd had assembled and it, we, we used to do Sankatan, we had a centre downtown, we would come back for lunch and things like that. And, uh, and a couple of, couple of uh, doors up from our, our place, I noticed there was smoke coming out of this building, flames were coming out, and there were some women, you know, screaming out, help, help. And uh, one of them, I think, was on the ledge or something like that. Apparently the fire had come up the, the stairwell and blocked their exit. And they were up in like on the third floor. So myself and I think Yasso, another devotee, we were both out and saying, we came back, we were looking up and the, the, uh, these girls, they were just young girls actually, they were just like 19 or 20, they were screaming, help, help us, help. the fire brigade hadn't arrived. We must have just, arrived. we came back just at that time when it just it was all happening and the fire brigade hadn't arrived yet. So they were screaming, it's coming up the stairs, it's coming closer, like that. So I was looking at Yasso, he's looking at me and we ran back to the shop and I said, and in the shop, they, all the preparations were going on for the Rathi parade. There was all sorts of things all over the floor, and the, the, the managers were, were working on the canopy for the, the Rath cart, and putting on the finishing touches. And, uh, and I think Yasso said, Let, Quick, give us that canopy. Right? And we got this huge canopy, you know, the, the Rathi <laughs> cart canopy that covers the, 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 the top part of the cart. So we got it, and we, we took it out in the street. And we spread it out, and uh, and we got a whole bunch of kami. It was I guess there was like half a dozen devotees came out, and a whole bunch of kamis were there, and we we spread it out all over real tight, and it went out round. Like sometimes you see these firemen, they get these kind of round tarpaulin things, and they hold, and people jump on them. So we I mean we were thinking like that that they could jump onto this thing. So we held it out and we stretched it right out, and then we all yeah jump jump. <laughs> so, the girls, I didn't want to jump, you know, I mean, obviously it was a long way from up there, up there to down there onto this thing, you know, they didn't know what, you know what to make of it. Jump, jump, jump. And I remember one girl, no, 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 I don't want to jump. <laughs> so, uh, I, I think that, that girl didn't jump. She went out the back and tried to get across to another building or something like that. But one girl did jump. To my amazement, because I actually thought they wouldn't jump. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, she did jump. She came flying down, boo! And it was okay. The the, the canopy, <laughs> Lord Jagannath's canopy, had had saved her. The canopy had held. I mean, she didn't drop through the canopy and splatter on the ground or anything. So you know, all the, all the, the devotees, how do you know? And all the kamis, you know, they hey! like this, you know. And then uh, now I think there was one or two, a couple jumped. And then, the, the, then somehow the press had come, arrived already by that stage. They were taking photos. The fire brigade arrived just after that. And I think anyone else who was left in the building, they got out. But later night, that night, it was reported to Prabhupada. And the next day, it kind of, it, that, that story made the front page of practically all the papers here in Melbourne and actually even in other cities. And, and what, it got into the front page of one national paper. And it said, uh, Hare Krishna has saved women from blazing inferno. He <laughs> was to that effect. The prophet was very happy. He was very happy when he and, he and he and he actually told the devotees to get all the clips and save the clips. He wanted he wanted a copy of those clips and he wanted to take them with him. And he said, "This is very good. This is very good for our reputation." So it was an interesting <laughs> story that I remember. And again, also, you know, when we got to Mayapur. In 77, that was just before Prabhupada got his real, you know, that really bad sickness which eventually led to his disappearance. <clears throat> we had been down to Bhubaneswar and then we came up to Calcutta to stay for a month or so. And um, one man came from Mahesh Pandit Samadhi and he wanted, he was a Pajari there, like the Saivite, and he wanted Srila Prabhupada to come and do a program there. We knew it was going to be very small, you know, what we would kind of consider a rinky-dink little 
affair, you know. We knew it. And, um, but Prabhupada immediately agreed to the man's request. He had come during the massage and spoke in Bengali. So Prabhupada agreed and then he went away. And, but I couldn't speak Bengali, but I knew what, what was going on. So then I was kind of unhappy because I knew how weak Prabhupada was by that time. And in fact, when we first arrived in Mayapur, one morning on the balcony after breakfast, Prabhupada was looking out over the fields and then he turned to me and he said, never in my life have I felt as weak as I do now. But then he, and then he added, he said, but still I would like to finish this Bhagavatam. And I had seen evidences of Prabhupada's decrease in general health and fitness. Several times I had had to literally um, pick him up um, when he had collapsed on staircases. So anyway, I, you know, I was just very concerned. So when this man came, I really didn't want Prabhupada to go. And so um, I asked him, a, you know, kind of a little complainingly, I guess, you know, Srila Prabhupada, why do you have to go? He said, no, no, he's asked, I must go. He said, it's preaching. So I said, but Prabhupada, there's so many sannyasis here, they can all do the program. He said, no, he wants me to go, I must go. So, um, you know, because I was a bit upset by it, then Prabhupada said, just like, you know, that story in the Krishna book about Prajumna, he was injured on the battlefield. And so when he was taken, then immediately he went back to fight, even though he was injured. So he said that was his duty. So then I said, but Srila Prabhupada, it was his charioteer's duty to take him off the battlefield when he was sick. So then Prabhupada said, yes, and it was his duty to immediately return and fight. <laughs> so he defeated me, you know. <clears throat> So that, was, you know, again, it was, his, well, we, it was his determination, and we did do that program. Prabhupada just simply wanted to encourage the man, and we went and we did that program. And um, I, I remember that it was, you know, there was like a pandala stage, and there was some really rickety steps, about four or five steps leading up to the stage. So when Prabhupada approached that to go up, um, he didn't ask for help or anything. And he immediately, you know, started stepping up one by one. And by that time, I was already aware of how weak he was. So I was standing on the step below him. As he went up one step, I went up one step. And I had my hands out like this, just in case anything happened. And uh, Prabhupada was actually pushing himself up the steps with his cane. He had so little strength in his legs. So he put one foot up. And then to get the other one up, he would actually push himself up with this cane. <clears throat> so when he got to the second to top step, he was straining like anything. And then all of a sudden, he just, his strength went and he just collapsed. But I was right behind him, stood on the lower step, and I just caught him. And I just, you know, had to literally carry him up to the top and put him on the, on the stage. And uh, I put him up there, and Prabhupada just, you know, walked over to his seat and sat down like nothing had happened. So, you know, Prabhupada literally sacrificed his, his, his life for us. There's no question of it. I'm sorry, he just wore his body out. If Prabhupada, you know, if there was a cause for Prabhupada's disappearance, you know, like a cause of death, uh, the Kamis are always fond of identifying the cause of death. You could just say that Prabhupada wore his body out in the service of mankind. That was the cause of his death. Krishna Kirtan Gana Tanapano Premamritam Banidhi